Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the NAM show. You've gotten through security. You're really happy about that. You're thinking about lunch, but you know if you leave, it'll take you at least an hour to get back through that line and that metal detector. So what should you do in the meantime? Come on down to the McDSP booth. I got Greg Price here and Brad Maddox. They're from Diablo Hello. Digital. They do live sound stuff and all kinds of other music production. In fact, they've made a business out of being in the music business. So if you want to learn how you do that, here are the experts. <laughs> Who am I? Well, my name is Colin McDowell. I work at McDSP. We've been making plugins for 20 years and hopefully 20 more. So if you like what we do, check out our website, mcdsp.com. We have a subscription. It's really cheap right now because we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. So if you signed up for it, we'll keep you on that cheap price forever. Okay, that's about all I have to say. Now it's time for the interview part, the informative part of our show. But wait, there's more. Because when I'm done, or when they're done, <laughs> we're going to give away some plugins, possibly a subscription. So all you have to do is sit and watch me yammer, oh, wow. and you can escape with some plugins and some free T-shirts. Okay, I've only been doing it for 20 years. So, Greg, Brad, I have to start with my number one question. Well, three questions. First one being, why'd you get into audio? Well, for me, I uh, my brother was in a band called Pablo Cruz, and I was living in L.A. and I went to the studio one day. And I saw these two guys in front of the console. That was Val Garay and Greg Ladani. And I saw those two guys and I go, that's it. I got to do that. Brad? I, I was the keyboard player in the band and I was literally the only guy that knew how to work <laughs> the console. <laughs> so here I am, 35 years later. I barely play keyboards anymore. Uh, it's just for fun. but. Uh, yeah, so I made a career out of live, live uh, engineering. And as I expected, neither of these gentlemen decided to drop a few names. I will now do it for them. You've probably heard of bands like Tool, Rush, Black Sabbath. Yeah, those are their clients. So let's be clear, some of the biggest bands ever, and they've done front of house for these guys. Which brings me to my next question. What kind of human being would want to do front of house where you're surrounded by 20,000 people who one moment are your best friends, and the next moment are your worst enemies. It's just how, why, take it away. First of all, it's the love of music. I, as a child, wrecked many records listening to them over and over again. So music, for me, has been part of my life. But to be in that big audience with all those people and a big PA, the power in your fingertips is amazing. And you have, it's a, it's a very rewarding uh, phenomenon, if you will. So for me, I just love that, that uh, ability to do that. Brad? Well, I, uh, I also just really like the challenge. I like the day-to-day -day walking into a room and it's an entirely different uh, environment from the show before that it's a, uh, coming in early, getting everything set up and dialed in just right, and creating the best experience for an audience on a nightly basis. Um, it can be brutal, there's no question. There are nights where it's just not going your way, and uh, you know you you just do your best on any in any given hockey rink. <laughs> but uh, you know, more and more we have better and better tools, thanks to McDSP. And, uh, Absolutely, Colin. Uh, that that challenge is becoming, uh, I won't say easier, I mean, it's still challenging, but uh, there's a joke. Can I tell a joke? Do you know who the best front of house engineer is? The best one, best front of house engineer? Um, well, since you're asking, I guess it's Greg? No, it's everybody. <laughs> oh. The audience. You, you are catering to dozens of thousands of, tens of thousands of people any given night all of whom have their own idea about everything and haven't been there all day dealing with the, uh, you know, the setting up the PA in the hockey rink or wherever. But anyway, I, I've always loved the challenge of it, and uh, I, we don't get it right 100% of the time, but uh, I like giving it the old college try every night. Yeah, in the, in the modern era, that challenge is very particular. So the, the ticket buyer is really expecting very good audio, and you help us get there. Colin, with your products. 
Well, I was going to say, even as the tools get better, and, and thank you for using some of McDSPs, um, from what I see in live sound productions, it's always, the ante is always going up and up and up. You know, it's not enough to have. Correct. And even like, it's not just enough to sound good. They want you to sound as good or even better than the record. Better than the record. Better than the record, yes. In well, because I believe musicians are playing live better than the record they made. Okay. So they get it out on tour, and man, the legs on that song grow. And we grow with it, Brad and I. And so we're all part of that growth and that power that happens on a live performance. Yeah, That's gotta... Again, this is where your products come in, because your products help us have the impact to grow that sound. There is a much higher expectation for quality of, of sound at a concert now. than there. I can remember, I'm old enough to remember going to concerts and I would, it was a success if I could understand the vocals and hear the guitar solos. Right. Uh, I think people really come with an expectation that the, concert's going, the production of the concert is going to be as good, if not better than the production of, of the record. It's going to be the record plus dancing and costume changes and, and an amazing light show. I, I go to a show and I see 3D audio, or I mean 3D video. I want to hear 3D audio Yeah. when I'm there in the audience. Yep. So that's the, that's the expectation now, and it's way, way higher than it was uh, 20, hell, even several years ago. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, do you think that, like, you know, because we're in the digital age, everything's in the computer, or you know, that sometimes... Well, the expectations when the audience are much, much higher that, if you will, sometimes the client's like, oh, yeah, you can do this in a day. You only need like half a day of setup. Or we'll fly the PA in the morning and, you know, just do you find the schedules get compressed or is it, is it, do you just have to work with whatever you get? Well, the, you have to, you have to ju get a workflow so that you do have the time you need to get where you need to go audio wise. But we do a lot of that work before the tour ever goes on on the road. Yeah, could you, could you describe brings, some of that? That brings Diablo Digital into, into the focus yeah. because we formed a company so that we could work on our, our artists before we actually take it on tour. Yeah, there's, uh, so it's a, not only a level of pre-production but also post-production. Uh, um, so we, we do live capture of the concerts. We do, uh, and not just our own, I mean other people's as well. And, uh, uh, Greg has, uh, could tell you a long story about um, his post-production with uh, Black, Black Sabbath. Sabbath. And uh, I've done a number of uh, little post-production projects with Rush. Uh, it's something we'd like to evangelize about and get other people to do, um, add to their workflow. But also so pre from pre-production through the tour, uh, tweaking mixes, uh, sound checking to your actual band as opposed to somebody else's record or... So I, kn I know that you know that we're live sound engineers, but we're recording and capturing those performances. And Brad and I want to turn those performances into records, into movie content, into YouTube content, into ringtones. We want to use the work that we've done on tour and create other things for our artists. And also too, this pre-production gives us a chance to really scrutinize your products to really find that right yeah, we gotta talk. plug yeah. in. <laughs> yep. No, I mean that yeah. No, for sure. And and that's uh, but it it helps us to get our clients up to the that number one, you know, that ultimate level before they even do a show, have maybe before they even do a production rehearsal. Okay. And yeah, it's kind of convenient for McDSP because we can make you the plugins that work in Pro Tools and then the plugins also work like on the Avid S6L yeah, and then right, exactly and there you go well no this as soon as no sooner than you drop a new plugin on the on your website we're dropping it in our console on to on our shop testing it finding out what we can do with it how it works with my workflow how it takes my you know analog guitar player sound to a whole nother level on a digital console by the way I think, and Greg can speak to the he is, his use of the tools in, in post production for uh, a DVD for mixing uh, concert live concert and post. I'm gonna also guess that with the up and the ante of the live show, as you try to go into a post production workflow, and hey, here's the concert footage. We're making a movie out of it. Even that content, they also expect, oh, it was even better at the show. 
Well, now that you've had a chance to mix it some, it'll be even better than what I just saw, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just up, 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 right? No, that's correct. So look, every tour has a break. So last, on Black Sabbath, I came home on a month break because the gear had to go from Europe to the United States. I immediately got Brad, we went into our studio and we developed a YouTube product for Black Sabbath. Okay. That's what we do. That's, we couldn't do that without having some form of studio to, to do offline from, from uh, live Yeah, sound. which is, yeah. raises the point of the, the line between the studio and live is, is go, and technically, from a technical point of view, is, is really blurring. Like, this a lot of this stuff crosses over one way and the other. One, one last note I want to make to your audience, is that is, is that the same McDSP plugins I used in the Collis, in any arena in our country, worked on the movie that I recorded. So I did not change, like I told you before, yeah. Ozzy's plugin that I used live on the record. Same plugin. Cool. <laughs> um, well, that's some good stuff. Any questions for these guys? You kind of have like two super experts here. And you want to mix like a giant monster rock band, tips, tricks, <laughs> what you should wear. Black no, cargo yeah. shorts. Black <laughs> cargo shorts. Well, now I know. Okay. Well, then, I think um, Greg, Brad, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to give away some plugins. So, all right. Yes. Oh, I guess I should ask do you have some favorite McDSP plugins you use? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay. So, for me, Back in the analog day, I was in love with the 5, 500 frame. This was a frame, an analog frame, that you could take card components like a, a DBX 160 something and, and stick them in cards. And then you roll out the 6050. So for me, on guitar, it was like a dream come true because you have many things in there that I'm able to line up and really get that, say, quote, British 70s guitar sound that I've always been looking for within one central place. I didn't have to chain plugins. I didn't have to, you know, do a combination of, of an analog insert and a plugin. It was all there right in front of me. So the ability for me to bring a, a rock guitar to its analog beauty, it was all right there in front of me within the 6050. Then the second thing is the AE series, 8400, and that plug-in was invaluable. Not only live mixing for what I call subtractive EQing, but in the studio, because you know you've taken a live recording and you bring it into the studio and it's just loaded with extra sound artifacts that you don't want. That plug-in on the drums especially, the 400 or the 600, invaluable, invaluable. And then of course, ML 4000 or 8000. On Ozzy's vocal, it was a game changer. Game changer and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put it up against your competitor's plugin, but know this, I ended up using that plugin, not the other one. Noted. Um, Brad, you got any favorites? Well, I, I would like to echo that the, the whole idea of being able to, within a framework of a plugin, that to emulate basically your, create your own channel strip. So that, that it. and it's not so much that any one, they're all really good that I would make any one of them a favorite, but just that I could take this on bass, this on vocal, and, and take a digital console and, and make part of it a, sound like an a, API, part of it sound like an SSL, part of it sound like, that has this compressor dropped in the middle of it, or that compressor dropped in the it's emulation. We both worked for a long, long time with bands from the 70s 70 and 80s, zero. and there were yeah. sounds that, that those bands had and you know they were recorded and mixed on classic series. You know, one you know one decade it was all Neve, one decade it was all API or SSL or whatever. And this, so you have a 
a certain rock sound from the 70s, a certain rock sound, rock pop sound from the 80s, to be able to emulate those sounds, it, it just on, you know, the, oh, I want the drums to sound like they came through just, this, just to have to that be, certain pop Just to rock. be clear to your audience, is it's our job to faith, faithfully reproduce those sounds that were recorded in the 70s. Yes, we're mixing on digital consoles, and yes, we've moved into a whole new era, but we have to replace, we have to represent faithfully those sounds, and that's what he's talking about. It's like, it's like you're trying to pull this record that was made in 1982 and pull it into the 21st century. It still has to be like that, and I don't mean sound like that exactly, but it has to have that character. You can't exactly. just suddenly make it sound like it's 2012 when the band is playing a classic rock song from 1984. It still has to have that quality. And There's that's one the other plug-in I want to bring up to your audience, and, that, and I, want, I want your viewers to really get this out, get it in their session, and play with it, and that's Foodsbox. Oh, yep. Did I say that right? Uh, Futzbox or Futzbox? Uh, yeah, it, I it, think Futzbox is the German. The German. I like Futzbox. Okay. Futzbox. Das Boot. Futzbox. Got it. But um, no, it, it turned out really good. It's, it's great to see it used in live sound. You know, for all kinds of stuff. This plugin. This is a. I'm one of those people that I'll take what everybody says is a vocal plugin, and put it on the snare drum, just to be different, right? Because I want to hear that sound. This is, this is another thing about our work. Is we're able to have the freedom to take everything you make and put it on things that you would never dream of doing. And yeah. if you don't like it, if it doesn't work, you disengage it. It's wonderful. <laughs> All right. Cool. Has well, anybody got a question? talking about emulation and emulating like a lot of the older type stuff you know um, we have a lot of the vintage plugins H how much do you accept as we start putting them on bigger and bigger PAs like a lot of the noise and artifacts that were in those units how much do you guys I mean how much do we want to accept I mean when you have that big old you know 60 cycle hum that they actually sampled into the I mean wh where do we stop with that you know this is a great question everyone this is really a good question well, so I've, I've evolved on this question because I started out leaving all of that in. I really, really li like I liked the, the quality it brought to it. Over time, I've found myself turning it off more and more and more to the point where I still feel like I have the characteristic, the tone shaping of a, of a certain EQ, uh, but now it's just really clear. Without the buzz. You keep the good stuff, you know what I mean, right? It, yeah. So is it something that you know, people like McDSPs leaving in there for the studio cats versus when we take those into the live worlds or something like that that we just don't want to use? Is that? Yeah. I, I, can I answer for him? So for me, I believe it should be left. It's up to us as engineers and producers to go ahead and say, you know what? I'm going to use a little bit of this to my taste, but if it's not there, then I've got nowhere to go. I want to have it there so that I can have full use of that spectrum. But then, but I'm with you on, on how much of it do we leave in. I think Brad's point is perfect. We have to be careful. We leave just enough of it for character. I think that you wanna, where I am landed now is I leave, I find myself leaving it in a certain place. I find myself leaving it on bass, weirdly. Like, um, but I don't wanna hear it when nothing's going on. You know what I mean? Like I, I want it to just be something that's ha uh, under underneath, and then when the band stops playing, I don't want it to continue to be because that was that buzz we spent so much time trying to get rid of. Right? No, because I think you're right. That's right. Yeah, right, right, right. No, but the the PA systems now are so pristine. That's another thing. We're that's really changed. getting to reference live format PA systems got away from all the copper and so the PA systems got quieter and quieter so our noise floors went down but now we're adding all the uh, DSP stuff back into it and it's you can grow that right back up very quickly depending on how much of that you get. That's a good point but I I like what you're saying because I like to leave it quiet 
That way when the band comes out on the downbeat, that clean, pristine system that we're on, it just goes right out front. It just comes to you very quickly. Yeah, I think they're just sort of thinking about this now in hindsight, moving from uh, mixing a band where I, you know we had a hundred inputs of analog console in uh, you know back in whatever 2000 say and then and then now we're introduced with a digital console and now plugins are getting put on because so my first trip with the digital console there were it was pre plugins uh, when we started adding plugins in I, I feel like maybe the noise was just part of the concept because we had been spent so much time mixing on analog and that noise was always inherent the longer I go with it, the more I find myself turning the noise off. That, that for uh, ten, year go, 10 years ago, I would not have said that. 10 years ago, I said I like to have a little of that. It's sort of a, it's sort of a weirdly weird to say this, but it's kind of a, a glue that everything. It's sort of, but now, now, no, now I'm not like I'm finding myself rather. I just want this to be crystal clear. I just want the characteristic of whatever it is I'm trying to uh, emulate. I, I looked at Brad one day, well, what's that noise? We, yeah, it was every, <laughs> we turned was the plugins here. off and there you go. Wasn't coming from the guitar. So great, great, great question. Anybody else? Don't be scared. Well, there you go, Colin. All right, well, um, let's give it up for uh, Greg and Brad, please. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. And. Um, well, let's let's give away some plugins. One, two, three. Okay, there you go. Thanks, everybody.